Switching gears, kind of talking more about Washington, our closest neighbor here, and uh, that's where I reside, and um, talking about off-premise chains. That's usually a scary thing for people. For me, it was when I first moved here. I wanted to give you a little bit of my background just to kind of give you um, an insight into how I came to the Northwest, and uh, I started my journey in Chicago, which is a much different market than here, obviously. We call it the wild, wild west. Uh, Chicago or Illinois is an open market. It's um, uh, lots of you know deals and that sort of thing. I worked for a small distributor um, that had probably similar to like a galaxy that had wonderful wines from all over, but, but quite a few Oregon wineries in there as well. So, and that was 1996, so um, a while ago. And uh, um, my next venture took me to um, the Sacramento area, but uh, via supplier, still working in Chicago. I show that uh, shot there because it kind of shows the difference between the Dunnigan Hills, which was the AVA for um, uh, R.H. Phillips, which is a winery that doesn't exist anymore, that I worked for um, in the late 90s. And uh, I very much wanted to be a regional manager. I was young and single and uh, thought that would be a lot of fun. And I heard about a winery that you guys are all familiar with, King Estate, that was hiring a regional manager at that time. So I literally left my national sales meeting in the Dunnigan Hills, right outside of Sacramento, in February. and somehow made my way to Eugene on a Sunday night and uh, in February. So as you can imagine, Chicago girl uh, trying to find my way out to King Estate on a Sunday night. First of all, getting from Sacramento to Eugene in 1998 was quite a challenge, um, but I made it. Um, I was uh, rented my car. Of course, there was no navigation at that time. So I was uh, driving along that road, and I'm thinking, oh my god, what have I gotten myself into? This is crazy. It's foggy. It's pouring down rain, it's freezing. I'm driving up this hill, just about to turn around, and I see this light on the hill. And I thought, what the hell is that? I keep driving, I see it in the fog. It was like literally out of a movie. And of course, that was King Estate. I don't think you guys leave the lights on anymore, right? Is that, uh, yeah, that was before we worried too much about that. But I drove up there and I, and I thought, well, my goodness, this is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. If they want to hire me, I'm going to take the job. So um, that was uh, when I started out in the Oregon wine industry. And my job at that time was to, um, was to represent Oregon, or specifically King Estate, in the Midwest and uh, Central Canada. So, you know, Oregon was still kind of up and coming at that time, um, and uh, selling the category was really interesting. So, uh, you know, selling, going to Missouri and going to places like Iowa and talking about Oregon wine and why they should have Oregon Pinot Noir and how, what's distinctive about it and what's exciting about it. And that was really a wonderful um, time um, in my life. And I actually um, worked with Steve Thompson and worked with King Estate off and on for um, 11 years. So um, eventually, not King Estate, but my husband actually brought me to um, Seattle. So I moved to Seattle and uh, actually worked with Rick Steckler here. You'll be hearing about in a, it from in a few minutes uh, with um, Click Wholesale in Seattle. and. Um, Ended up uh, most recently working for Gunlock Bunchu, which is uh, obviously a Sonoma winery. I was their national sales manager from Seattle, which was interesting. But I, I put that on here um, because I know a lot of you guys are new to the distribution business. They've been around a long time. They're the oldest family and winery in California, 1858, uh, six generations. Um, but there's still, you know, it's still a challenge for them even now. I mean, imagine the fact that you need a gun, lock, a bun, and a shoe to tell somebody how to actually say the name of your winery. So when you talk about heart and soul and authenticity and the challenges that, you know, a winery that's 156 years old faces um, getting their message out to the market um, and really being able to... Um, embrace the authenticity and the originality. We talked about the cool factor, but sort of what makes, what makes your winery different? And I think that's the most important thing to um, think about. And finally, I landed where I am today, um, the estates group within Young's Market. Um, we have uh, the smaller family-owned wineries uh, for the most part. So we're kind of a small company within a large company, which is uh, an interesting place to be. We have a lot of wonderful brands, and, and including a few of the folks that are here today um, from Oregon, um, and uh, um, just 
my job was actually very interesting because when I came from Chicago, I had no idea how to sell into the chains. It's not a chain market to, um, for the most part. It's a specialty retail market. So I thought, um, when someone told me I had to sell to a chain, I was like, well, you know, you just drag the bag, you go and you go out and you can sell, you know. They said, go ahead, drag the bag, but you'll go to a, a store. I remember my first work with in, in Washington and I went into West Seattle Cellars um, with a bag full of uh, Australian wines that were fairly esoteric. And he said, I'll take two of those and three of those and two of those. And, and I walked out of there and I thought, I just sold 10 cases of wine. And the rep looked at me and said, you just sold 10 bottles of wine there, sister. <laughs> so uh, it was a big adjustment for me. But I learned that the chains in the Northwest are different than they are anywhere else. And there is a lot of opportunity for small brands. There's a lot of opportunity for, for everyone, but you have to learn how to work the system. And it's very complicated, and it's especially complicated because it keeps changing. So um, when you look at Washington, many of you heard about the big you know, laws that, that change. So it's sort of where you look you know, we have to kind of figure out where we were before we can figure out how to move forward. So Washington pre-1183 looked a lot like Oregon, right? Um, bottle one, you know, we, everybody it was all fair. You buy one bottle, you buy 10,000 bottles, same price, right? Um, no deals. So there was no, you know, I was it, was, it was strange when I left Chicago and I came here and I was just like, oh, I just talk about the wine and they buy it or not. And uh, there's no wheeling and dealing. And Huge selections. This was something that was new to, to me. And, and it was interesting when Bob was talking about restaurants in Oregon and Washington. Huge wine list. Don't buy a second, or if you want a second bottle, you better, you better have a, a third option because most likely they're not carrying that much inventory. So because they don't have to. If you only have to buy one bottle of everything, you're more likely to have 100 wines on your wine list. You might only have 10 cases in the back room, right? So um, this was something that was new to me as well because you know, in, in most markets in the US, you buy by the case, you get a deal, you get a buy the glass price, you get a, you know, a five case stack price if you're in a, in a retailer, even a small retailer, and um, you don't have that, that type of selection. So that was, that was new. Small inventories, huge, huge. Um, issue and obviously selling the wine, not the deal, right? So everyone was on a level playing field. It was beautiful, right? Very peaceful. It was fabulous. And then, of course, um, wait a minute. We had uh, you know on premise the big wine list, the more selection, um, less volume, specialty retail bottle shops. I had never heard of a bottle shop before I moved to the Northwest. This was new to me. Um, uh, the huge chain market. 80 to 90% of the business in Washington is done in the chains, even the fine wine business. Probably more like 50-50 for uh, family wineries, but it's still a huge, huge um, opportunity and a huge part of the business, which was completely new to me. Um, and then it's kind of selling to the wine stewards, just being able to come walk in and chat, chat them up and being able to sell to them like you would in a specialty retail shop or on-premise. So then, of course, we had 1183. And uh, overnight, a uh, big explosion happened um, a couple of years ago. And it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. We had uh, you know, spirits um, being sold in retail locations over 10,000 feet. So that essentially, um, that even uh, some of our, our little uh, bottle shops, um, a few of them made the bill there. But for the most part, all of the chains now had spirits coming in. And you would think, why wouldn't they take a little more spot out of you know, the bread aisle or something where they're not getting nearly as much value for that space? But unfortunately, the wine business um, took a little bit of a blow there. Um, quantity discounts. Now all of a sudden, we could pretty much do whatever we wanted in terms of quantity discounts. So overnight, things started to change there as well. Um, central warehousing. Um, Places like Kroger and Safeway, which include QFC and, and Fred Meyer, um, now we're able to have a central warehouse. Well, they're not going to necessarily put things in the central warehouse. Like any, most of the wineries that I sell, I have these small family wineries, they're not going to fit the bill for the central warehouse. But how the central warehousing affects our business and perhaps our opportunities is that they're going to try and carry more of the things that they can put in that central warehouse. So 
and, and I know this is confusing, so I'm going to explain. So you have a brand, let's say, like Chateau Saint Michel. Um, for instance, obviously that is a brand that they're gonna sell lots of. They're going to get a bitter, better price if they can buy more of it at one time, right? They, Kroger now is, has the ability to put that in a bit, buy big, put that in a big warehouse, and then ship it out to all of their, their stores on an as-needed basis. So it gives them that added. So what that does, though, is it gives them more of a um, uh, incentive for them to, um, uh, put more of those wines on the floor and in the store. So for brands like the brands in my portfolio and, and possibly most of your brands, it gives us a little less space to deal with when we're trying to sell into the wine stewards, gives them a little less autonomy. Now it's not gone, but it's still, um, it's just something to be aware of as you're kind of trying to figure the whole crazy mess out. Um, and then channel pricing, you can have an on-premise price, and you can have an off-premise price. And you can that has to be done on quantity. So like, for instance, you want to have a, a hot by the glass. You have a $20 Pinot Noir, but you want to actually offer that. You want to give your distributor a little extra funding because you want to hit a $15 by the glass price. You can offer that as like a 2K deal or something. And you can actually have a separate price for on-premise as off-premise. And this sounds like a crazy thing, but I, I mean, really, um, I think 70% of the rest of the country has been doing this forever. So it's, it's, it's you know, it, it just is kind of, you just kind of have to get used to the, the new way of thinking, I guess it's, it's interesting. But here's where they made it really challenging. We have, okay, now you can sell quantity, great. Now you can, you know, buy five cases one time and get a great price, but it's still COD. So that puts, you in a, in a difficult spot because you don't have people that are like, well, hey, I can buy that five cases, I can get this great display, and then I don't have to pay for 30 days so I can figure it all out. They have to pay on the spot. So it, it kind of, um, in a way, keeps things from, kept everything from really getting completely out of control, right? So, um, but very interesting. And um, there's a lot of pros. You can offer on-premise better pricing. You can put together quantity buying opportunities for customers, both on and off premise. So, um, and, and we're finding that there's ways to be creative with this. Um, so, you know, most of the brands that we're talking about in this room and the brands that I sell aren't brands necessarily that Kroger or Safeway is gonna wanna buy truckloads of, you know, let's be honest. It's going to be brand, uh, places that really wanna build brands other than the brands that are in Kroger and Safeway because they need to promote something differently now because they're not getting the same price anymore as, a, as, as if, if you're saying um, a smaller chain isn't going to be able to have the buying power that say a Safeway or a QFC would, you know what though? Then they're gonna look for something interesting and, and uh, unique that they can promote and make their own they might still have to carry some of these large items, but maybe they're not gonna have a big you know, display or they're not gonna promote it. They're not, gonna, they're not really gonna get behind it in the same way they would have um, before the law. So I think there's some really good opportunity there. The cons are the smaller wine sets and the chains in some cases because of the introduction of spirits. And then also um, the smaller wine selections um, in the chains uh, because of the central warehousing. And there is, I, I, I say this, this is like, I should have put a star in front of this because I don't really 100% believe this, but it, it, it does seem to be happening. There is somewhat of a dimish, diminished ability to sell to the wine stewards in the same way we used to pre the law. There are still opportunities and there's still ways to do it, but the, the, the games have changed. Uh, the game has changed a little bit. So um, just kind of be aware of that. So now we wonder, you know, what do we do now, you know? And honestly, we're still trying to figure it out. I, um, the laws have continued to evolve a little bit and it, it continues to be very interesting. Um, but there's still a lot of chain opportunities in Washington, even for the smallest of brands. Um, I think brand building 101, we talked about the cool factor. For me, it's authenticity. It's what makes you different. Find a method to the madness. How do I, what do I do kind of first step, second step, and third step to become a successful off-premise brand in Washington, which is imperative um, for the health of your brand in that state. 
Um, you have to do the math. On-premise is great, and there's a lot of opportunities there. But we really do, when you look at where the business is done, even for small brands, you really do need to look at the chain business um, in order to make, uh, because it's still COD, to get any kind of volume, to get um, some uh, more share of mine from your distributor, you need to become a player both on and off-premise. And I think sometimes small I always say it used to aggravate me because, of course, I was the chain person for the estates group. Now I'm over everything. I'm over on-premise and off-premise. But it annoyed me that, that I'd have a lot of my wineries come in, and they'd work with the on-premise people, and then they'd leave. And, but we'd have a 30% increase of a goal. And uh, I said, OK, well, just thinking here. So 60% of your business is done in the chains. You're spending all of your 100% of your resources and time with the people that do 40% of your business. You give us a 30% increase. If they get, let's just say they get a 40% increase, you're still not going to even come close to making the goal that you gave us because it's basically like you're pretending this business is just something to be taken, uh, taken for granted. And honestly, it's, it really isn't. You, you need to just think about it a little differently. So we look at it. We've got short-term, mid-term, and long-term opportunities. And this is going to go deeper than a lot of you guys really want to go, to be honest with you. So I'm going to spend a little more time when we talk about this part, the short-term opportunities, selling the old-fashioned way. If we can't sell to the wine stewards in exactly the same way, what can we do? You know, what can we do? Um, we still have lots of specialty retail opportunities. And, and um, uh, you know, you've got Wine World and Lesha Mart, Seattle Wine Company, McCarthy and Shearing, all great options for um, old-fashioned brand building. And of course, on-premise, you put in that same boat. You know, brands are built on-premise. You want to you want to build a great off-premise brand. Start by building the on-premise and getting the on-premise people behind you, and they're the ones that can create that cool factor for you. They f they help you kind of find out what it is about your brand that makes it applicable and uh, makes it um, uh, make sense for um, each market. Um, and then the wine stewards. And I broke this down sort of by chain, because each one, again, nothing's easy, right? But it makes it fun. It's like putting together a big, gigantic puzzle. Um, the QFC and Fred Meyer wine stewards, they um, need to be the items that Bob mentioned early. You can sell things into the wine stewards. They have small areas where they have autonomy to buy in. However, they have to go through this authorization process. So it's slow going, but the benefit is, the benefit is if you really do want to grow, and at, at some point you want to be considered more broadly by these chains, which are quite honestly for fine wine are, are, are still one of the best, is that um, you get some wine stewards behind your brands. You get them authorized, and it's a it's a, it's a painstaking process, but you get it done. You get a few of those guys behind your brand. You can actually show in the Nielsen data in a year that your brand is viable and your brand is growing. And then that gives your um, distributor personnel the, uh, the, the, um, the ability to go into the headquarter buyers and say, hey, look, you know, this, this awesome little brand in Oregon is killing it. And the good news about this, guys, is even though Fred Meyer and QFC are part of Kroger, which is from Cincinnati, they are just as afraid of us, for the most part, as the rest of the country. Like, the Northwest is crazy. We don't know what to do with them. So we're going to let them continue to make the majority of their own decisions. So they, can, they don't have to follow what you know, Kroger in you know, wherever uh, California is doing. They look at their own internal data to make decisions. So you want to grow, you can, put some, you can put a lot of effort in this. And it might take a few years, but you can make a difference. And you can get to the next level. And there's examples of that in this room here. So um, it, we, know, we know it can be done. Um, another great uh, chain, there's about uh, 15 of these, that Hagen Wine Stewards. There's, there's really about, I'd say about 10 of these wine stewards, great. And they'll get behind a brand, and they seriously will move the needle. Again, I have several examples of small family brands that I've done little events for with this Hagen Wine Stewards. They've fallen in love with it. They sell the heck out of it after we go through, again, the annoying, horrible authorization process. But they get it done, 
and they can move the needle for you. So you can prove that your brand has legs and, and you can move it kind of to the next level. Met Market, you guys are from a great small chain, similar to like a New Seasons. There's five, there's Wine Stewards. He does, he, he more than anybody, is looking for specific brands that are interesting, that he can promote, that are not the mainstream brands that you see in, in most grocery stores. Um, Northwest Grocers, that's Thriftway and Red Apple. Great opportunities. These are, these are all independents, guys. So this, this is still like, you, are, you have a buyer that sort of tries to do some ads and he, he's great, he tries to kind of herd them, but they make all their own decisions. So there's, there's like, uh, you know, I'd say about 10 of them that you really have some, some really great opportunity to walk in and sell a lot of wine. And again, that all hits the Nielsen data. That's a great way to build a brand for you. Town and Country, another nice little five, uh, five um, chain account. Whole Foods, now there's good news and bad news about Whole Foods. Whole Foods, um, you need authorizations. The good news is that despite the fact that the Whole Foods buyer is eliminating a lot of SKUs um, from everywhere else in the world, he's, he is actually encouraging more Northwest wine uh, SKUs because he was actually over skewed in other areas and under skewed there. So you can work with your distributor to try and gain authorizations, I would say, especially on your focus items. And, um, and then once you have those authorizations, which he's saying he wants to give to Northwest Winery, so that's where it's good, you, then you have to work at the street level to, um, to, get it, to, to get that rolling. So, you know, I had a, somebody asked Bob a question about, um, you know, how do you, you know, it's so expensive to travel and all of that. And I, believe me, I, I've been there. I know, I know all about that. I had a very small budget and I'm trying to cover the whole country. I'm like, how do you do that? But this would be a way. You could drive, if you got some authorizations in Whole Foods, you could drive up there, you could work those wine stewards, and if they get behind something, again, they move the needle. These wine stewards talk. They're sort of like their own little group where, you know, a brand gets hot. They, you know, the, Anne from Thriftway is going to talk to Sherry from Met Market, and before you know it, you know, there's like a wine steward movement with a few brands. So there, there, it takes work, but you can, there's a lot of stuff you can do with that. Total Wine, we always call this kind of the Mr. Burns of the, uh, from like, remember from the Simpsons of the wine industry. They're a little evil, but I will tell you they do buy wine and they do like um, a lot of, diff they like to have a huge assortment of wine. So um, work through your distributors, see what the opportunities are there. For the most part, um, unless you're really like, you know, f they're having some battle with Costco or something, they won't mess with your price point too much. So. Um, they're interesting. There, there is an opportunity there. And then Costco, again, that's sort of, uh, I know, a scary thing to talk about right now, and especially when we talk about them being sort of behind the whole 1183 movement. You know, they, um, they sell a lot of fine wine, and I've, I've done a lot of good business in Costco over the years, and you know what? Um, the wineries that I've worked for, that I've done Costco business for, it really didn't harm them as much as, as everyone thinks. So, they look for scores. You need to move something that has a good score. It's, it's, it's an opportunity to think about. Um, and then midterm opportunities. So that's quite, sort of phase one. So you get that going. You're, you got a few wine stewards behind it. They're talking. You're doing some wine steward events. And, and you're getting things rolling. You're starting to build a name for yourself. Um, then, then, you, then you can go kind of to these middle guys to try and gain more broad-based distribution. You know, maybe Met Market would authorize your um, brand in the whole, in all five stores. Um, town and country, same thing. Um, Northwest Grocers, those are, those are independents. He can, once he sees a few of his independent guys doing something with it, then he can say, great, I'm gonna run an ad on that guy. I think he's great and my two favorite wine stewards love it and, and why not? Um, PCC, organic, uh, very, um, very interesting uh, account. A lot of opportunities for those of you who are, who are super, uh, who are smaller. Again, that's what they're looking for. They are looking for value, though. That's PCC markets. Um, so he's more or less under twenty dollars retail, but he can. They they will get behind anybody that isn't everywhere. So a lot of opportunities for those of you who are smaller there. And again, the Hagen's chain, being that it's relatively small, you make an impact with the wine stewards your next step is to get full authorizations in, in all the stores and, and potentially cut into the set. So, and then this is, this is really a, a long-term 
project, <laughs> believe me. I started this with a, a long time ago for, but this is when you really get to the point where you really wanna be everywhere and you can be, and that's sort of after phase one and phase two. And, and, you know, and then at that point, you're, you're, a, huge, uh, you're a huge brand. So um, that's kind of how I thought about it because otherwise I, I literally, when I first came here from Chicago, I, I went to a meeting with the chain person at Young's and I worked for King Estate, or no, I worked for actually Coppola. And I, she was telling me, well, you need to have a program. And I was like, I don't know, what is a program? Like I, had, I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And you know, really what she was saying is you need, to, um, you need to tell us who you are. You need to be able to clearly identify internally and externally what it is that makes you unique and how you choose to do that you know, and what you can, and it doesn't have to be expensive. You just have to be creative. And I think that's the biggest thing. So when I think about the chains, and again, I have this huge portfolio, all a lot of small brands, and I go, I sell, as you know, Young's is a big company, right? So I not only am selling to the outside to tell them about my brands, but I'm selling internally to tell my own people about my brands because I have the Young's people that are selling to the chain. So, you know, they look at my brands and they're like, oh, these scare me, you know? So I tried to categorize things for them and I, I keep the established brands, kind of keep building them, build on your success. You already have a skew that you have in a lot of wine stewards, focus on that before you try and get four other things rolling. You know, if you have two things, focus on those. I think the mistake is made when a, a lot of times with brands that aren't established is when they come and they have, we have 17 priorities. We have no distribution and we have 17 priorities, yeah, especially to the chain people, that's terrifying. And then they just, they just can't even, it's, they just are paralyzed. So they just do nothing. So whatever is your biggest item, your biggest um, success, keep on building. Um, Focus on underdeveloped brands and market misses. Here's where I think if you've got a brand or an item here in Oregon that you guys are killing it with, but you're doing nothing in Washington, you can use that. You go to a chain buyer and you talk to them about California Nielsen, they look at you like you've said, you've literally said like the F-bomb, like they're like, they think you're just horrible. But if you come and you say, listen, in Oregon, this brand is super hot and here's where I'm selling it and here's the restaurants that it's in then I think that this is a great opportunity. That is a, a character of my boss who gets crazy about my California brands that are big brands in California, but we're doing nothing with um, in Washington and Oregon because it's just such a different market. But these are the brands that have a proven track record somewhere else that you can, you can, um, you can talk about. And then the unique, different, and fun brands to promote. This is where I feel like we have a lot of opportunity in this room for the Mark Takagis from Met Market, for the PCCs of the world, for even these wine stewards, they are looking for unique, different, and fun to promote brands. They're looking for opportunity brands. In many cases, this falls in value too right now, again, because they're trying to look for things that they can sell against some of the other big volume um, items, but it doesn't have to. And uh, um, you know, they're really looking for these things. Um, and, and they don't go by the rules of the rest of the country, you know? I mean, they're, they're just, we're all trying to figure this out, so there is no rules. So I think the biggest thing to do is to move forward with a lot of enthusiasm and just try and make it happen. And then of course we have our high image, high scoring, high price wines. Anybody have a good score out there and you've got a, 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 a brand that has a tremendous reputation for winemaking, et cetera, um, you can always sell those even into Safeway. You can sell them into anywhere because, um, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, high-end Northwest wines that get good scores and have a great uh, image, you can even get them, you can get placements mid-year. I just made some Safeway placements where you're not like supposed to like twice a year and it's the, the rule and the law. Well, they, they just put in some of my Walla Walla wines because they needed to fill some slots. And so great opportunities there too. So as you're developing your brand plan, you know, just kind of think about some of those different things. So then this is, this is where um, uh, Steve and I uh, have talked about this a lot, is that um, I know sideways, you're probably thinking, well, God, that was a long time ago. Are you really gonna bring that up right now? But I really do feel like um, Oregon had a huge, undoubtedly, I was, I was here, I was working for King Estate when this whole thing happened. And 
Oregon undoubtedly benefited from it. And I went back because I don't know why, um, and I wanted to see what was in the numbers. I can't look at on-premise data as much, and I could only go back five years because that's as far back as we had data. But I thought this was really interesting to look. I think the 2008 Nielsen compares 2008 to 2007. Sideways came out in 2000, late in 2004, so it was really 2006, 2007 before it started to take effect. But um, in um, Seattle Nielsen in 2008, Oregon is the fifth largest category in the market. It was up 10%. 2% of the total wine category in Washington, and the average unit price was $14. Um, 2013, again, just curious. And uh, it's the, now the eighth largest category in the market. Some of the imports, like Argentina and things like that, have kind of taken that spot. Flat over the previous year, the growth. So, so no growth, um, two per, still 2% 2 of the total wine category, and the average unit price have actually gone down a skosh. So not that it's bad. I mean, the, the floor hasn't fallen out, but I feel like we need to do something more. And I mean, I, because I have such a love of Oregon, I don't, feel this, I don't feel that I hear the same in Washington about Oregon. And I know that, that you guys have plans to do some things, but I just I think there's, there's more we can do. And I wanted to compare it to Portland just to kind of see how that all looks. So uh, Oregon is the third largest category in the market. Um, Oregon is 12.3% uh, of the total wine category. Again, this is in Portland. And Nielsen is only, it's really Safeway, Kroger, um, any uh, Rays, places like that, um, that are going to scan. Um, Washington is 163 of the total wine category. And then when you look at uh, what happens here, is that Oregon has actually lost a little ground, even here in Oregon. And again, this is total wine consumption. It doesn't necessarily mean the volume has gone down. It could have meant other volume went up around it. But Washington has definitely gained some ground. Um, you know, they're, they're, they've been at it. You know, they're, they're strong, and, and uh, they've got some big, big dollars and big companies behind them. So, um, but I feel like there's so much opportunity in uh, Washington. I mean, you look at that, it's like, come on, like we could do so much more. And not just in the chains, but I think everywhere. I just feel like Oregon, we're, you guys are right here. And it is expensive to travel everywhere except for Washington. So come, join us. <laughs> Bring back that love and feeling. And um, I, I, Oregon Wine Month, I know there's a thing and there's posters and they're beautiful and I love them. But like, if there's, you know, if there's anything you guys can do to like just amp that up, go bigger, do some tastings, do get something going. Um, because I, I, you know, we've got a great group of Psalms in Seattle. I don't know if you guys saw that article in the New York Times, but there's more Psalms per capita in Seattle than there is like anywhere in the world. If, you, if we could somehow, you know, build on that and create some excitement, I think we could really do a lot. I know you guys have this Pinot in the City um, thing this week, which is great. Um, I didn't hear a lot about it until recently, so maybe that was just me. I don't know why, but um, but you know, again, going bigger, going louder, you know, telling everybody you know. Um, I don't know, but I just feel like there's there's more that can be done, and I'm not giving you any answers at all here. I'm just saying, I love Oregon wines, and I think the fact that you're right next to Washington. And it's, I mean, and I know Oregon is more than just Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris, but when you look at what Washington does well and what Oregon does well, it's like the perfect combination, you know? It's peas and carrots, right? And so just to see kind of that disparity, I think is unfortunate. And I think there's a lot more to be done. So um, we were talking about practical things that you can do as a brand. And some of you might have distributors in Washington, some of you might not. So, when you, when you do get one, some of these are really important. But even as a even when you're selling at the tasting room, I think it amazes me how many wineries that I go visit that don't seem to really even be able to tell me why they're different, why are they distinctive, why are they authentic. Whether you're cool or not cool, whatever. I mean, it's like, but you're authentically you, and that's what makes it so important. And here's how these are the three things that make my wine are different. And when you're talking to the chain people, I love them, and, um, but you kind of really have to make it more simple because they're not gonna geek out a lot of times like the on-premise people. So really explain to them why they're different. Making simple sell sheets, again, to describe your uniqueness, 
you know, to illustrate any, any scores, anything that's exciting, and making those easily accessible on your website if you have one, or emailing it to the, to the, uh, to the um, distributor on an, as you get things and to create excitement. If you can't be there all the time, to be able to kind of show all the cool things that are happening at your winery, so important. Um, we talked about pricing the wines for success. I, I think that's super important. And, and I, that's gonna be different for everybody, but you know, um, trying to figure out what your competitive set is. You know, when you talk about retail, you're looking at, and again, we're mostly at well over $10 here in this room, but we're talking about maybe $12.99, $14.99, then you jump up to $19.99, then you're $24.99. 20, so you're, you're looking at where you would fall wholesale and adding 30 points onto that to find out where your ultimate retail point would be. Super important, because I'll tell you, $21.99, I mean, forget it. You know, you might, you might as well be $24.99 at that point, I think, or, you know, obviously, as a distributor person, we would say $19.99, but. Um, and uh, shelf talkers with scores, really great if you can have those available and accessible and updated. Oh my God, it's amazing um, how many people have, oh, I've got great, we've got a great website, we've got shop talkers, and there's two vintages behind. Because when you need them, it's literally, you're going out that day or the, the next hour, and if you go to the website and it, it's not right, and then you have to call the person, and then you just give up, and you know, so. Um, identifying your competitive set for strategic selling. What, you know, who do you see yourself by and, and how and why? What is it about them that makes you wanna be next to them? Or you know, just kind of think about um, who you're inspired by and, and try and figure that all out. Um, and again, this is, this is again sort of a, the pet peeve of mine that the chains in Washington, even as they stand for small brands, are still probably gonna be about 50% of your business. So, you really need it. We need to think about it and be strategic about it and try and talk um, to those people. Work with the chain distributor people. You know, the on premise people get stuff all the time. They get, you know, here, get, we'll take you out to dinner. Here's some wine. I want to, here's a shirt, you know, whatever. The chain people get very little of that. So they appreciate a little extra attention. And a lot of that can go a long way. You get a, a person that calls in a lot of off premise accounts that's great at it and they become your little brand ambassador, sometimes just one or two people at a distributor, that, that can be your number. I mean, that can be huge. And getting them to love you, and then they start telling the same thing, it spreads. It's a small market, it's a small industry. You guys do right by your distributors, you are put out a positive, concise message. Your brand is gonna grow and develop. Um, it just takes energy and enthusiasm. Um, so for me, and again, obviously I'm into enthusiasm, that's kind of my thing, but I think being different is key. And, and that is something, if you take away anything today, I feel like that's so important, is to be able to say, if, if I'm a brand and I'm trying to figure it out, well, why should, just like Bob said, why do I matter? It's just so important. And I saw this last night, and I just wanted to throw it in here. I saw this from Dale Carnegie. The, the roadmap to success for me is flaming enthusiasm backed up by horse sense and persistence is usually the quality that uh, frequently leads to success. So you, know, you go out there, and you're talking about your brand, because every single one of you has a wonderful, authentic brand. And you're in this business because you love it, right? I mean, we're in it because we love wine, and, and you love what you represent. And you can, you can do that, but if you come in and just do that, and then you don't send the email like, hey, I was just in the market, you know, did you do X, 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 and X, then they'll love you, and they'll be super excited the next time you come in town, but you know, you're selling yourself um, inside the distributor, and, um, and, and really, the horse sense, I think, for me, is being practical, too, like really, really being practical about providing very simple tools to your distributors. You can't afford big POS and programming and you know, bells and whistles, that's okay. Just concise, clear communication, I think, is so important. So, so that is um, kind of the, the, the basic roadmap that I have for, for the chains. Um, I don't know if, does anybody have any questions? Yes? So for the buyers in the chain, talk about buying during a quarterly set. What's the timing for that? Is it, uh, is it like a month? Is it two weeks? Is it right in their for, time? Are you talking about, um, can you repeat that? Um, well, they talked about a quarterly set, which I, uh, which I take to mean every quarter um, they have a turnover where some of the wines go out and new brands come in. 
Um, and yeah, I know that you talk to them after the yeah. court and they're not going to touch you. Right, yeah. So <laughs> what's a good time so that you're fresh in their mind? You know, it's hard because everybody's different. Even among, like, let's say QFCs, they do resets, but they do them, they, they, cause, because it takes like a whole team of people to go in and do a reset. So, you know, they can't do them all at the same time. So I don't know, I've, I've never heard of the quarterly reset um, that specific. Um, but I know, like, they'll, you just find out when they're doing the resets and make sure that you're not doing get there when they're doing that. Like, but for instance, like when people, like big, big companies say like a Safeway, they have two times a year where they consider new items. Um, and then they, one of them is called a refresh in the fall. They're doing that now. And then they do one more like a, a more of an overhaul um, in, in uh, you, you submit for like ju uh, January and then they let you know by March. But in terms of like smaller chains that just are doing resets, I think it's really up to that, not only the individual chain, but also the individual store as to when they're doing it. So, sorry. I don't think there's any easy answer on that one. They don't actually do it on the quarter the way this Pardon me? I, I have never heard that, but you know, maybe, I'm not saying that some chains and some stores might not schedule it that way, but I, I don't know that it's that, um, you know, everybody's doing it like that. I haven't heard that, so. Anybody else? Yes, hi. I was I, you had a great um, slide that listed the kind of washing re retailers. Yes. Can you put that back up? Or oh, yeah, sure. There? So yeah. I have, um, oh, <laughs> I have to go back through these backwards. I don't, I'm sure there's an easy way to do it, but I don't know what it is. Uh, oh, boy. Lots of clicking here, guys. Sorry. Um, so those are the big, you're probably thinking, do you, do you want to look at the, the, middle, the middle one? The one that had Oh, ah, what just happened? Okay. So those guys, yeah, sure. Okay, um, anyone else? Yes, did, did she need the? Oh. I definitely rep. Um, she wondered about UPC codes. I, I don't think, and I, I, you know, I could be wrong about this, but I don't think that many on-premise um, restaurants like think you're horrible if you have a UPC code. I think that used to be what perhaps way back when, like it meant that you were a retail brand because you had a UPC code. I have wonderful brands within my portfolio that have UPC codes. When you don't have a UPC code, um, it makes it very difficult to get beyond like kind of a one hit in, in, a, in a store like a Fred Meyer. They, they will bring in unauthorized items without UPCs at Fred Meyer. So if you're looking at it in the short term, there is, they, they actually like that because then they can kind of fly under the radar. But if you're looking for long term building a brand and you want to be involved in the chains at all, not having a UPC code is such a headache for your distributor and for the account. A lot of times we have to if you don't have one, we have to like print one for you and then sticker it and then the warehouse people get mad at us and it's this whole thing. So that's kind of where I stand on the UPC issue. Um, I was gonna ask how uh, proactive should or could wineries be about approaching um, liaisons for these chains about tenders or submission deadlines because sometimes we're um, doing really well in a chain in a certain market and they have kind of regional yeah. branches. And maybe we're with smaller distributors and other markets who don't really have a relationship with them and we want to maybe approach their um, executives ourselves but don't want to step on the toes of the distributors but want to make sure we're getting coverage if it's, a bit, um, if it's possible. Yeah. In those other markets. I, I mean, I think if your distributors, I would think most of them in Washington, Oregon should have somebody there that has relationships with most of the major um, chains just because they've been doing business so long. If they don't and they can't do it for you, absolutely, I'd go straight for it. I mean, it, and you know, but when you go, make sure that you have something to back up your claims. Like, you know, here, this is what we're doing in Washington. We've been this, or in Oregon, we've been successful in X number of steward stores in Washington. I think we're ready for, to be part of your set. 
you know, have a kind of a story to go in. I think sometimes small wineries will go into, a, you get into these chain meetings and they're very, it's very different than calling on a restaurant. They're very sort of, um, you know, they're numbers oriented, even the small guys for the most part. They're looking at, at what's gonna sell, what's gonna, what, what they already kind of know can sell. They, they wanna know what tastes good too and about the quality, but so, um, I, I would make sure that you don't just go in there with tech sheets, basically. If you get in front of a headquarter buyer, explain why you're relevant to them and what past successes will lead to future successes for them, for your brand. Anybody else? Okay, great. Okay, sure.